This is Debunk TV. What is truth? They are two different Absolutely. claims. So, like, truth is basically subjective. This is a worldview thing. No fuss flies eyeball. Trust me. This is Debunk TV. Bob Coons here, right in front of you, live and well, I take it. Carl yep. Kirby, to I'm the here. left, how you doing? I'm blessed. Okay, man, so we're. this is part two of yes. The Bible Can't Be Trusted. Absolutely. And but you got to do it with your, your other one. The Bible can't be trusted. Well, really. the, well, the Bible can't be trusted. <laughs> yeah, that's Hank, or whatever that guy's name with the straw thing. <laughs> Concoction of the theory. I wish I could memorize all those things. Yeah. I don't. But anyway, so we're going to start with the video again. Yes. And then we're going to go into a different proof. Absolutely. Here we go. It's extremely popular these days to say the Bible can't be trusted, but really? Now, my goal here is not to give a bunch of proofs like the unassailable prophecy proof, the fact that there are literally hundreds of precise, clear, and specific future events spoken in the Bible, sometimes hundreds of years before they actually happen. You know, no other book can claim that, but who cares? I'm not even going to dig into the internal consistency proof that demonstrates the amazing unity of the Bible, or even its miraculous survival over the centuries. No, 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 no. I'm just going to ask you to be honest and follow along. Let's say you find a piece of paper in a hotel with this written on it. It was at 822 Fifth Street in someplace Texas when Scott somebody was mayor. Jim lived there with his wife and two daughters. Most people called him Little Jim. He liked to wear a gray baseball cap and blue overalls. He was a manager of a place called Corner Pantry where he worked for a long time. The town called him a hero because he fought in a war. He's also a hero because one rainy day he lifted a huge car off of a child all by himself. He died on April 4th, 1990. 500 people were at his funeral. Signed, Polly. That's it. Now what part do you believe and what part are you skeptical about? If you are skeptical, why? Because you automatically rule out certain kinds of things? Because a professor or friend told you something? Or did you investigate for yourself? Hey, I'm just asking. Now for the fun of it, yes, this is actually fun for me. Let's just say you don't believe any of it and you're determined to prove it all wrong. Okay, first thing you do is pop up a map and look for someplace Texas. Well, there it is. It's a real place. You go there and find 822 Fifth Street. Facts are checking out, but you're not easily fooled. You go to the local newspaper archives and you find that Scott somebody was indeed the mayor, and you see little Jim died on April 4th, 1990. The article also mentions his service in the army and that around 500 people were at little Jim's funeral. But wait a second. You notice the word manager is misspelled on that piece of paper, and two words were misread. Trickery, you shout. This writer has concocted a story to fool us and somehow got all these things to line up with their foolhardy fabrication. You don't have a motive or a reason, but come on. You're not going to let this deplorable, downright dubious dummy deceive a determined decoder destined to demystify delirious drivel, so you focus on the car lifting scenario. If you can disprove that, you assume for some arbitrary reason, the whole story is a lie. So, you locate an old storage place that one of Lil Jim's daughters rents. You find a drawing of a man lifting a car off a girl, a license plate, and another piece of paper that says, Thank you, Dad, for saving my sister's life. I saw a miracle that day. You ponder for a moment, then consider the best explanation. Well, I think you get where I'm going. The Bible is much like Polly's letter, citing names, places, and events which can be investigated. So happens over 25,000 archaeological finds have confirmed people, places, and events in the Bible. Not one has ever refuted it. Then we have the question of motive. Why would Polly put all these facts in her letter, then lie or somehow make a mistake about the most important part of the story that she saw with her own eyes? Even more, how is it that the writers of the Bible get all the common things right, but somehow get the uncommon things wrong, especially the New Testament writers whose lives were on the line? I mean, would you put your life on the line and testify to something you were unsure about or knew was a lie? No way, not a chance. No, these writers, like honest historical writers, other ancient biographers or dutiful journalists today recorded what they witnessed, what they heard from eyewitnesses, what they investigated, and what was passed down to them from trustworthy people. They weren't tricked, fooled, mistaken, or making stuff up. Just listen. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he warred and how he reigned, behold, they are written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Simple and straightforward, right? This is how most of the Bible is written. Don't believe me? Read it for yourself. But suffice to say, this ridiculous assertion, this unjustified claim that the Bible can't be trusted has been debunked. Adios. All right, Bob, that's great. So last time we showed that it was actually reliable, but how in the world are we going to show that it's true? You have a whole other test for that, yeah. right? You have this whole thing that I mean, under, you know, I call it the truth test, but mm -hmm. underneath that you have, you know, what we call the correspondence theory of truth. Yep, yep. And 
all we're really trying to do here, I think this, you know, I guess here's the a very brainy way this. to say I it. I love this. Yeah. This, is, this is where I love Juan. Yeah. Because Juan yeah. is that guy. Yeah. You know, he's got he's the, the laws and, and that yeah. sort of thing. When testing any proposition in an attempt to verify its truthfulness, there are several tests you can apply. One of the most powerful is the test of correspondence. It is expressed technically as P is true if and only if P corresponds to a fact or reality, where P refers to any proposition one wishes to evaluate. In other words, something is true if it corresponds with reality. For instance, if I claim that there are 13 bottles of iced tea in my refrigerator, and you wish to test the truthfulness of my claim, what would you do? The easiest thing to do would be to open the refrigerator, count the number of bottles. If there are 13 bottles, then you have tested my claim and found it to be true. What I claim corresponds with reality. If not, then you have found my claim to be false. When it comes to the claims of the Bible, many of them can be tested this same way. For instance, the Bible claims that the universe was created. It began to exist. It is not eternal. The claim can and has been tested with the test of correspondence and has been found to be true. By the way, it has not only been tested by Christians. It has been tested and found to be true by atheists and skeptics and some of the world's greatest scientists, such as Hawking and Einstein and others. Even Richard Dawkins admits that the evidence for the universe having had a beginning is undeniable. Here's another one. The Bible claims to be the Word of God. How can we apply the test of correspondence to this claim? Well, if the Bible is the Word of God, one would expect to find things in it that could not possibly have originated in the minds of men. When we look at the detailed predictions of the future events that we find in the pages of the Bible and confirm these, in fact, did occur as predicted, that constitutes evidence that it could not have been the product of human intellect. Thus, the claim is true. The Bible, time after time, passes the correspondence test. I'm the simple guy, yeah, you know, the like, rubber meets the road yeah, guy. What is P? Yeah. <laughs> no, I can't find the P. You know, I, it, yeah. But I think, you know, it, the way I look at this one, it's uh, imagine an attorney going in and it's a murder case and the jury's there yeah. and you get the guy up on the witness. And the, so the judge, the jury and the lawyers are looking for things that correspond to reality. So where were you last Tuesday yeah. when, you know, Billy got shot and the guy goes, well, I'm from Jupiter and my laser, yeah. you're, you're starting to go that you know, we can, we, we are an innately, for the most part, we have insights when things are a little Some, off and we right. can figure it out pretty quick. But when you add hundreds and hundreds, yeah. right, tons of witnesses, and then you look at all of the cross, you're trying to say, does all that correspond to the reality? And does it all really have a coherence, which is the next part of the test? Does it all cohere? And when it does, it seems to pass, uh, you know, some just basic tests that we would we would put to ourselves. So how how does this how do we do this with the Bible though? Through? Well, I think one of the things that I love is uh, first one is creation versus evolution. Yeah. So there, so think about this because that's my background. I've yeah. loved this for such a long time. You've got ideas that are competing right here, and one idea says that uh, in the beginning nothing turned itself into everything that we see. And the other says in the beginning, there was something, intelligence, that created everything that we saw. So those two ideas are competing with each other. So when we go to the world that we live in, what we see in the world around us is a consistent with, in the beginning, nothing turned itself into something, yep. which we did. We yep. covered that one yep. really well. Uh, or the fact that when you look at the world around us, do you see design? And yep. we see design everywhere that we turn. It's like, it's hard not to see it. I, yep. I tell folks like this, Bob, if you take anything that God made and you look at it under an electron microscope, yep. the further down you go, the more amazing the more it is. The beautiful it gets. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a mosquito. I got electron yeah, microscope yeah. pictures of an eye of a mosquito. <laughs> yeah. But then you take anything that man made, the sharpest needle on the planet, you will never want to get another shot in your yeah, life it when you see it. all breaks down. And it's, you yeah. look at it, it looks like junk. Yeah. This is a topic that, to me, absolutely corresponds with the fact that there was an intelligence that created... The way that he said that. Yeah. He did. How do you get? How do you get something that's material from the immaterial? Right. It's exactly. Like, how do you? How, do, how does time begin without something outside of time? So when you look at just the in which we did in in one of our videos, mm -hmm. it is when you, when you look at the world around you, you know we know that somebody made this. Right. So we assume right, right. that okay, well somebody made set, something around. I mean, someone this built set, this, yeah. organized yeah. it. Yeah. It's rational to think a mind was behind this. Yep. And the law of information says that any time you see information, there has to be a mind behind right. it. So who could create this big? It has to be personal, powerful, 
you know, smart, yep. loving, has to be, you know, has to make choices. It, this is not non-material nothingness. Right, right, right. It can't, it can't, it can't make anything. So it seems when you look around and, and the fact that the, the mathematical odds of one protein folding to do anything outrules evolution. You look at it and you start yeah. doing it, it becomes ridiculous what what corresponds best to reality exactly. is, uh, is, there was is intelligence there's an intelligence that, did, that created it. What he said that he and did. Here's, here's what yeah. scripture says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in Psalm 19, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Yeah. That's what I think we see. Exactly. I think millions of people come up to the shore or a mountain and go, they don't sit there and go, yeah. wow, what an accident we are. No, no. You know, people, some people do, but the majority of the people have a, <gasps> there's a feeling, they get it. There's Absolutely. A, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, the, the other one I think is that the, Bob, by, the Bible's really honest with is the nature of man. Oh, yeah. I mean, come on. We're told that when we're born, I mean, man is basically good. Children yeah. are basically good. And yeah. wait till you have a child. You I find mean, out yeah, really quickly. Yeah, yeah. Please. No, they're not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're selfish. They're greedy. Yeah. They, you know, they're... They, well, they steal and lie. Exactly. <laughs> and so like, uh, second nature to them. Which one? Two ideas. One that, oh, man is born basically good. And the other says, no, we're born a sinner. This to me is like one of the clearest ones that you can see. Yeah. When All you got to do is pick up a newspaper, yeah. pick up a magazine like, and look at, if I, you can, watch a, a, a TV show yeah. or a movie. And it's like... Well, I think everybody, okay. especially now in culture, even with the divisive nature of it, even politics or anything, we we assume, we look around and we go, something's wrong. Yeah. And if yeah. we say something's wrong, now we have a standard. And the standard becomes, uh-oh, if you, mm -hmm. there's something wrong, then the, the, then we go, well, what is? What, you know, the nature of man is, is fallen and broken. Yep. You know it in yourself. We know it. Absolutely. And what does Scripture say? Scripture defines it beautifully. For from within... Out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, that's me, yeah. sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, witness, deceit, Wickedness. sexuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that... Come, look, that's what we that's see. That's so true it about is, what we yeah, see. Absolutely. Yeah. When you see us at our core, and when I'll be honest with you, when you see yourself at yeah, your core, you a, know it. Put a mirror on yourself. I know it. Yeah. Yeah. You absolutely know it. No surprise... Much attention is given to humanity by various intellectual disciplines today. The number of disciplines that make human nature or human behavior the primary object of their attention continues to grow at a rapid pace. However, the study of the human race has been challenging and a bit contradictory at times. On the one hand, humans are amazing in their feats and accomplishments. But on the other hand, they seem capable of cruelty not found even among animals. And there's no consensus in academia regarding the nature of man. Current conceptions vary greatly. Some view humans as machines, valued only for what they can produce. Others view humans as animals, believing there is no qualitative difference between humans and other animals, except one of degrees. Others view focus exaggeratedly on just one aspect of humanity, defining humans primarily as sexual beings, a la Freud, or economic beings, or social beings, or free beings. Existentialists view humans as pawns of the universe, at the mercy of worldly forces that control their destiny, but that really have no concern for them, a la Sartre's The Wall, or Camus' Myth of Sisyphus, which, by the way, both are required reading in most schools. While all of these approaches may provide some elements of truth, they do so at the expense of disregarding other aspects of our own experience. They are incoherent. In contrast, the biblical description of human nature blows these conceptions out of the water. The Bible contains amazing wisdom when it comes to understanding human nature, as one would expect when it is written by the one who knows us best, our Creator. The Bible describes man as originating by a conscious, purposeful act of God, establishing the only conception of man that fully supports our innate value and our meaningful and purposeful existence. Being created in the image of God best explains the incredible intelligence of man, manifest by his outstanding accomplishments and our clear distinction from animals. Our sinful nature provides the most reasonable foundation for man's capacity for evil. In summary, the picture of humanity we find in the Bible perfectly coheres with what we know about man, unlike competing views.
another one. We can go on and on, but we're going to do a couple more yeah. because I want people just to get the fact when right. the Bible says it, it lines up and we're like, okay, there is a correspondence test. It corresponds to, to reality. So what about this one? Yeah, yeah, quickly on this one is uniformitarianism just says, look, the present is the key to the past. Things have been going on and on and on. So if you want to understand what happened in the past, take a look at today and then extrapolate back. Well, that's wrong because yeah. let's be honest. The only way to know what happened in the past is to have someone who was there who's trustworthy that you, that has told you what happened. And so we say the revelation is a key to the past. So yeah. presence not key to the past. Revelation is a key to the past. And if you want to see the evidence to support uniformitarianism, it's really not there. A perfect example yeah. is come dig dinosaur bones with us when we yeah. do one of our dinosaur digs or come down the Grand Canyon with us. And we'll show you literally the geologic layers uh, 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 over 100 feet, a couple hundred, 300 feet of bent strata. I mean, 90 degree yeah. turns Rocks and don't strata. seem to bend. How, does the ro how do rocks bend? Uniformitarian doesn't explain that yeah. at all. Oh, slowly, gradually, over millions of years, all those layers laid down, and then you bent rock? The only explanation is catastrophism. God judged sin the way that he said that yep. he did. Over the course of a year, a lot of dirt laid down rapidly at the Psalm 104. It talks about the rising of the mountains yep. after the flood. You get bending and soft strata. And, and not break, not bending of rock. So yeah. Again, well, I wouldn't say even uniformitarianism have to at least agree with one catastrophic event, oh, which is creation. They just say there's multiple. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. It's like we don't know where they are. It's this yeah. kind of thing. It's like, hey, well, there was one major one that you got Absolutely. to account for, and the second one that I think, I mean, which is creation, but the second one would be the would be flood, which is what you talked about. Again, what does Scripture say about this? Yep. This is what Peter says. They will say, that's people that are like looking at and mocking Jesus, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were. Yep. That's what people will say, that it's uniformitarianism. Absolutely. He says it right here. Yep. For they, But then here's it, they, they deliberately overlook this. Absolutely. So they know it, but they overlook it. It's not the an evidence problem. It's a spiritual problem. It's a problem. spiritual problem. That the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water, and through water by the word of God. Yep. And that by that same means... The world then existed was deluged. Yep. There was a flood. You're denying it. And if you want to see it, go to the and top even, of the I love it, even that we call I love that the Lord knows so much about everything because he's providential, but he even calls out the things that the very things that we're gonna uh, attack. Yeah. He already knows. He's already he's like, so what yeah. you know, what did what, like we were talking to Juan the other day and he was he was saying, What's the what's the stuff attacked in in, in, exactly. in the old testament? Jonah. You know, creation, the flood. What what does Jesus <laughs> refer to when he goes back? Jonah, exactly. yeah, the, the flood and Corbin creation. Is real history, he, he, exactly. real examples. People attack these accounts because they seem unbelievable. I get it. We should be skeptical of extraordinary claims. We should test them. Sometimes extraordinary claims are false, but sometimes they are true. Regarding creation, we have already tested the claims of a beginning and found them to be true. When we test the details of creation, we find amazing design there, pointing to a creator, not to unguided processes. Geology affirms the biblical account of the flood. And what about Jonah? Is it possible to be swallowed whole and survive to tell the story? It's extraordinary, yes, but impossible, no. Recently, a report came out of a diver that was partially swallowed by a whale as he was filming a documentary and he's not the first. Besides, the Bible doesn't teach that people can survive in a fish for three days. It teaches that God miraculously preserved the life of Jonah. There's a difference. I tell folks, if you want to see the evidence for this part, this global flood, yeah. go to the top of the tallest mountain on this planet, guess what you find? Oh. Evidence that it was underwater. Yeah. So there's that's a whole other area. Yeah. But, but one of your favorite areas is there. actually prophecy. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that, and we're going to get to that into the, the, how do we know the Word of God, yeah, which is yeah. in the next uh, the part of this, because it's going to take a, a little time. Yeah. But I like to look, you know, a lot of people can say that we predated certain things, and then we moved the date up, and because it, it gets so accurate that people have to start moving dates yeah. because they don't they don't think it can be happened. But I like to use kind of modern ones. Yeah, yeah. Like, there's a couple that Jesus himself said. That, yeah. I mean, it, it's hard to deny. Here's yeah. one of them. I said, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. You know how many people have come in the name of Christ, especially around the 18th century through the 21st century? Hey, turn turn on TV right now. We got the Messiah on there, brother. <laughs> we got so we got <laughs> a, like right a, a false Messiah pop, exactly. popping up, but and and, yeah. and people are buying into it, right? Oh, because yeah. we long for it. But here's a here's a here's a lowly carpenter. Yeah. 
2,000 years ago. Right. He's telling people that people are going to come after him. What if I said that? Yeah, yeah. Hey, Carl, before I die, but lots of people are going to come in Bub Coons' name. And right. I, you know, I got to show people. No one's going to come in my name. <laughs> people would pat you on the back and say, yeah, okay, well, they'll, they'll, yeah, they'll mock me and put a, you know, like a costume on it. I'm Bub. But I mean, this is legit stuff. Hundreds of people have come in the name yeah. of Jesus. Yep. I mean, how does he do that? The other one is the heaven and earth will pass away, but. My words will not pass away. Now, you can go, well, we're not forever yet. But again, Amen. we're a few Amen. thousand years, a couple thousand years forward, and his word's still here. So, I mean, these yes, are two prophecies that are at least true right now that, yep. that, have, that have actually happened. Mm -hmm. and, and there's over 300 in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Talk about this whole thing about God. We got a little demonstration because I think this I was funny this. when you looked I it up. This. I had to look it up. Good. Because when we were talking about this, I was like, so how many Bibles... This is God's word. Are so you can get rid of it. That have yes. been sold. Yes. Okay, so this isn't counting the ones that are in warehouses that yep. haven't been sold yet, that have been printed. And uh, the number is a little big. It's like six billion. Six right? billion Bibles. Six billion. And they're all uh, they're all in the hotel rooms around the world, right? <laughs> I don't think there's that many rooms, brother. <laughs> no, but many. there's six billion yeah. are, uh, copies of the scripture of uh, in foreign languages yep. and the ones that have been given away. But there's even more. And by the way, that number... That's from 2015. So I can tell you hmm. that there's been more printed and sold since uh, in the last five yeah. years, okay? Um, but here was the question I, I, I told you I wanted to ask you. Yes. What is the number two seller? Number two seller. Dan Brown's. Dan Brown. Oh, man, he's not even in the email. <laughs> Come on. Throw it out. No, it's like I, I uh, the, what do you call it? The Pilgrim's Progress. Nope. Okay. Nope. Nope. Quotations from Chairman Mao, the little red yeah. book. Yeah, that's the little number two book. seller of all books. And uh, just for comparison yeah. purposes, eight hundred to nine hundred million copies worldwide. A lot of copies, but not even close to six billion. God's word will not pass away. I mean, <laughs> I mean that. I wouldn't even thought of it that way. But in a, in a sense, it's not even falling. It's growing. Yeah. Right. Talk about not perishing. It's actually growing, it's and actually there's more growing. and more and more and more Absolutely. copies. Absolutely. So the last the last one on this on this subject is like yeah. this history and archaeology. We we say it a little bit in the video. Twenty five thousand archaeological finds have confirmed the things in the Bible. That's I mean I'm, that that's that's enough to, for me to go. The Bible corresponds to reality when it comes to the nature of man, when it comes to creation, when it comes to uniformitarianism, when it comes to to all these other things that also lines up with prophecy. A guy that can say something and it, it actually comes true. And yeah. then you can look in it and go, there's a there there it is. There's the glasses. There's the tomb. Yeah. There's the rock. There's the pool. And matter of fact, the, yeah, the, the pool. The, the, you were talking about this that. guy in, in John nine seven because this is recent and and this is Jesus. He's like he he tells this guy go wash in the pool of Siloam, which meant sin. So he went and washed and came back seeing. And you're like, look at that and go, pull a Siloam. You know? And then all of a sudden, we're, we're, here's what the, this new professor, they just found this, 2008, yeah. 2009. In the plaster of this pool were found coins that established the date of the pool to the years before and after Jesus. There is little question that this is in fact the pool of Siloam to which Jesus sent the blind man in John 3. Now this is one instance of 25,000. Oh, yeah. But I just wanted people to know, you can actually go, absolutely. pull a Siloam, this is where Jesus was. The miracle happened there. Yep, absolutely. The last part of the, of, we gotta go fast, the last part of the truth test is the whole con the, the co coherence thing. Sometimes the test of correspondence is not available because physical verification is impossible. That's when the test of coherence becomes a valuable tool. The test of coherence can be summarized with a question. Does the information contained in the proposition fit with everything else that we know? Do all the pieces of information we have investigated fit together smoothly, cohere, or do we find contradictory facts? For example, some people claim Jesus never existed. He's a fictional character made up by the gospel writers to con people into believing their story. The test of correspondence is not available for obvious reasons, so we must investigate the facts. And when we do, we find that every single detail we know points to Jesus having lived among us during the first century. Even skeptics like Bart Ehrman admit that Jesus was definitely a real person and lived during the first century in the Middle East. One of the most powerful things to me about Scripture mm -hmm. is is its it's, its un, it, the unity of it.
Mm-hmm. Right, you see, you got you got uh, f- over forty authors, over fourteen hundred years uh, uh, span. You got all kinds of people from all walks of life. You got uh, all kinds of controversial issues being talked Absolutely. about, and yet there's one unifying message throughout. Not find that pretty dang overwhelming when I consider that I don't really agree with you. Yeah. And if you and I were to write on a topic, we'd have discrepancies. And all the guys that are yeah. in this room, yeah. Yeah. we would go, even as Christians, Absolutely. we would go, I'm trying my best. And, and when outside of the, 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 the guidance of the Holy Spirit and this actually being authored by the Lord himself, how do you, exp- how do you explain that? It's pretty miraculous. It is. That's why I really, I would encourage you to read the, the, that book, uh, the, truth of, the Truth That Demands a Verdict. Yeah, Evidence That Demands a Evidence Verdict. That, yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank yeah. you for correcting me. Yeah. Evidence That Demands a Verdict by uh, Josh and Sean. It's so powerful. And there's even another one that I would encourage you to take a look at. It's called More Than a Carpenter. Yep. It's, a, it's a tiny book. It's an easy read. And just the information in there, look, it's been updated. It needs yeah. to be updated in numbers and everything. But the whole, the core arguments are solid. Yeah. I mean, the core arguments are solid. So, uh, But, Bob, this is great, all right? So... Uh, so it's true, but guess what? We've not proven that this is the Word of God. No, we got that it's reliable. Right. And, and we got that, hey, with what's within it seems to correspond to the truth. Right, right. But doesn't mean it's the Word of God. Exactly. The previous episode of Debunk TV addressed the reliability of the biblical text. This episode focuses on the truthfulness of the content. Considering the abundant eyewitness testimonies, the historical and archaeological accuracy of the content, the fulfilled prophecies, and the relevance of the Bible to this day, you simply can't dismiss the Bible as unreliable. As you have seen, the content of the Bible can and has been subjected to rigorous examination. Some of the most brilliant atheists and skeptics have put the Bible under the microscope in an attempt to find it unworthy of our trust, and they have failed miserably. In fact, Many of them have responded by believing the veracity of Scripture and putting their trust in Jesus. When the truth claims of the Bible are critically evaluated using the test of correspondence and the test of coherence, little room is left for doubt. It is a trustworthy source. Many of the biblical teachings can actually be subjected to both tests. We have already seen that even the most contested portions of the Bible can survive scrutiny. When we consider what the Bible teaches regarding human nature, just one of the many subjects mentioned in the Bible, we see an amazing correspondence with reality and a powerful coherence with what we know to be true about ourselves. In contrast, the alternative views fall way short of delivering a full picture of human nature. Our confidence in the reliability of the Bible can be founded upon overwhelming evidence in favor of its truth claims. Even if there are passages or ideas that we don't fully comprehend, the Bible can be trusted. Adios. See ya.